Let's talk to our panelists tonight. And just a reminder, we're streaming this conversation live on the CBC News Facebook page and on YouTube. We want to hear what you think. You're welcome to join us. And who is us? Well, let's start with Sheila North. Sheila is a Grand Chief with the Manitoba Kiwati Nawi Oki Makanak First Nation. And she joins me live uh, from Manitoba. Welcome to you. In Halifax, Gretchen Fitzgerald, National Thank Program Director with the Sierra Club. And in St. John's, Newfoundland, Tim Powers is Vice Chairman of Summa Strategies. Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you. Okay, Sheila North, let me begin Just with you. Just a clarification, oh, MKO. Yes. Sorry? Just a clarification, MKO represents 30 First Nations. 30 First Nations, yes. Okay, thank you for the correction. Yes. Sheila, let me begin with you. What do you. What's your first impression of the changes that the government has made? Well, you know, we're looking at it as a positive outlook on the future of how we license these kind of projects. Um, but we're hoping that there's more than just flowery words here, that we, that we actually uh, look at how we are regulating and approving projects that affect um, the lands and the people that live on them. We have to be, as the Swalatooth uh, member was saying, we have to be in on the process and decision making and, you know, at the approval table. So it has to go further than just flowery words. We have to see um, FPIC, for example, enshrined in, in the whole process. Okay, give me an example of what that would look like. Well, we have to have Indigenous knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge, and Indigenous people involved right at the, at the table where decisions are being made on which projects should be approved and funded. Um, but also in the regulation area, we, we have to look at these both areas in a separate way to, uh, to make sure that Indigenous knowledge is incorporated. Because, you know, our elders tell us that, you know, the, the, the regions that we're from, we are of the land that we have to protect. It. So we're the ones in, in our communities, my uncles and my, you know, my cousins in my, in my home community know the land best and they should have this, the say on what is being done to the land. Mining projects and mining companies that come from all over the world should not be uh, the ones regulating or approving projects in, in our territories. It should be the individual community. So mm -hmm. I think that you know, this is a step in the right direction, but we need to see further, um, further steps to make sure that the voice of Indigenous people is, is you know, reflected throughout the whole process from you, now on. When you say reflected, do you mean a veto? Because Catherine McKenna made it very clear that the buck stops with her at the end of the day. Well, that's just it. I think I think a lot of us would like to see a veto, and I know that a lot of people are probably holding their hands up in the air saying, no, I don't think so. But I think this, the pendulum has to swing the other way for a long time because we've seen what the devastating consequences have been in some areas on, on when we let industry just rule the whole you know the whole industry in in mining and, and other projects like that so we have to uh, be in on on the decision making and you know whether that means also veto then you know I think that's the right thing to do UNDRIP is you know the principles and articles in UNDRIP talk about that and I think that that is the most basic parts of the regulation that, that, that we could be incorporating. Okay, we have lots of people coming in on Twitter. I'm going to invite our other guests to comment as well. Uh, l let, me, let me start with you, Gretchen. Um, this is Law of Fives on Twitter saying, Liberals rename National Energy Board. <laughs> do, you, do you think that's true? Um, not entirely. It looks like they have uh, created a different role for this new energy uh, regulators so they won't be leading up uh, environmental assessments as they were with pipelines and that is a really good thing I mean um, there's a few good things in, the, in this in this draft bill but um, that's one of them is they've they've taken that role and put it into the impact new impact assessment agency that they're going to be creating so they think that is a, a, a good first step um, another thing they they say that will be really important to any assessment is getting in early for consultation so that uh, projects that <laughs> aren't going to meet with community approval, they get that knowledge. Uh, the proponent has required to go and get that knowledge early on so we don't have to go down so many roads that end up with, with communities having to rise up and block projects. Um, the other thing they've looked to is um, a climate test. So will a certain project 
allow Canada to meet its climate goals. All of these things are, 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 are good things that are, are, are in the proposed bill. Mm -hmm. But there's also some cause for concern, um, you know, uh, and we've been raising on the East Coast uh, alarms because it's looking like, uh, unlike the case of the National Energy Board, there's actually an increased role for the offshore oil and gas regulators in this draft bill, where they're going to be playing a role on uh, assessment mm -hmm. panels potentially okay. and nominating people to sit on them and um, <coughs> as Stephen Hazel from Nature Canada mentioned in the interview uh, before much depends on what panel what actually what projects actually come to a panel to be deliberated upon and uh -huh. if we're not assessing projects that could be damaging the environment things like seismic testing um, exploratory drilling all of these new rules are really um, not going to help the environment well it sounds like there's a lot of unknowns here Tim well, your colleague here in Newfoundland is only a Newfoundlander can. Captured it the right way, Carol, tonight. Peter Cowan said the, regula the, the law and the initiative today is as clear as drilling mud. <laughs> uh, and I think he, uh, he got it well and nailed it there. As, as both Gretchen and, and Chief North have pointed out, there's still so much to be learned about all of this. Gretchen makes a really great point. We're both on the East Coast here, and our offshore resources are jointly managed, or supposed to be jointly managed, by Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Canada. One of the concerns that's being raised on the East Coast from a different perspective to the one Gretchen raised is, well, how do the provinces play here? And you'll know from uh, the, the story you, you led the newscast with, mm -hmm. the fight between Alberta and mm -hmm. British Columbia wanting Ottawa to step in. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Newfoundland and Nova Scotia aren't going to want to have their roles diminished because separate legal agreements govern the offshore here. And today, I don't think they got any clarity. Uh, Gretchen mentioned the offshore petroleum boards. I don't think the one in Newfoundland didn't speak today because it's waiting to figure it out. I suspect the one in Nova Scotia did the same thing too, though in the same vein, the regional ministers are saying, oh yeah, they're going to play a key role, but nobody knows what that role is. Mm. Okay, uh, Philip Costa, any energy project based on fossil fuels should question how much it will contribute against Canada's goals to reduce greenhouse gases. Who wants to take on that one? Gretchen, I see you <laughs> nodding. I'm going to take that as you putting up your hand to volunteer. <laughs> yeah, yes, and, and one of the problems we've had with a lot of the pipeline projects that have been proposed and other projects like the Duncan coal mine here in Nova Scotia um, is that there was never a sort of a, a lens put to those projects to say, hey, w will approving these projects actually fit in with our climate goals? And in the case of pipelines, uh, demonstrably there were pipelines on the table that were going to uh, allow us to exceed targets. So. Um, that was always a problem with how assessments were performed. So if this is done correctly, and uh, Mr. McKenna announced today that they're actually going to be looking at a nationwide kind of climate uh, study of some, of some form under this new, new bill, you know, once it's passed, that's going to be one of the first things they're going to look at in terms of a regional uh, national assessment. That'll be really interesting to see how that mm. plays out. Um, so that we don't get so far down the pipe, if you want to talk about it, without <laughs> um, uh, you know, realizing actually this doesn't fit with our national uh, goals for climate. Okay. Um, can I pick up on one yeah, thing? Yeah, you sure Gretchen can, Tim. Go said. ahead. It, it, the timing of this, too. Today you have the, this uh, announcement. I think all three of us have alluded to this. It, it has to go through a legislative process first. People here who I understand were briefed by uh, uh, Natural Resources Canada are basically being told it's going to take two years before you really know what it looks like because as Gretchen and Chief North would appreciate, you have to see the regulations that come from the legislation. So today's, you know, give them the government full marks for a very good communications exercise, but what it's actually gonna mean, we're not <laughs> gonna know for a couple of years. And the challenge for the business community, as you know, is predictability. Should they invest? Shouldn't they invest? If other jurisdictions have clear rules and regulations that they know about, maybe they go there and they don't go here. And on the East Coast, where Gretchen and I both are today, uh, the offshore still matters a lot to those economies. <clears throat> okay, uh, Bill Paul on and Facebook. And I think the, the environmental go goals, sorry? No, go ahead. I was going to say uh, the environmental goals that we talk about are also, you know, in line to the traditional knowledge that our elders and our, mm -hmm. and our experts tell us. So I think they're closely more aligned than we think. And I think we're going back to some of the ways that our Indigenous people have been calling for to protect the environment and protect the land and waters. And we know 
all of us how important all of that is. So I think the environmental goals, goals and traditional knowledge are closer aligned than we think. And now we just have to find a way to, to go in the middle and, and, and agree to, to, um, to work together on that. Okay, so, so what essentially is changing here in the last couple of minutes we have? Because it, what would have changed, for example, in what's top of mind for a lot of people right now, and that is the expansion of the, the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline through British Columbia. Would any of these changes have had an impact on that project? Tim. Well, the minister said no. I'm not sure any of the three of us can give you a clear answer on that tonight, not having the opportunity to review all 300 and however many pages. But uh, there is some concern, again, using this, this uh, region as an example here that was expressed this evening after the announcement. Well, what happens to projects, not unlike Kinder Morgan, that are already in the system? Do they have to go back for a review? And does that counteract what you're trying to say, that this will be faster, more efficient with goals? No clear answer, as I understand, was given all, on all of that. The only one there where I heard a clear answer was in Kinder Morgan saying, the minister saying it wouldn't change it, but people here aren't sure what it means for, for projects in the pipeline. Yeah, and, and one of the criticisms that a former uh, Dennis McConaughey was with Trans Canada, uh, one of his criticisms was that the politics is still at the back end of this with the federal oh, government yeah. giving its go ahead at the very end of the process. He was saying that, that that's going to scare off investment because it should be done at the beginning and then let the technical play out. What do you think? Well, I would also turn that a bit on its head, Perhaps. too. I think we've been very disappointed here yeah. with the increased role of the offshore boards, and we think it shows that the oil lobby is, is very powerful in Ottawa <laughs> and, uh, and, and being listened to. And I think it is un unfortunate that we've seen an increased role, uh, or potentially an increased role for them in approving projects. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if Where the rules announced Where do you see the increased, today. Gretchen? Where yeah. do you see the increased role? Well, right now, if you want to do exploratory drilling or drilling, uh, production drilling, it's, it's reviewed mm -hmm. by the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency now, potentially, and much depends on what projects are actually going to be reviewed by panels. Uh, the offshore boards would actually be able to nominate or I guess potentially their board members could sit on panels and, and, and decide and, and advise on those, project, on those projects. So that's an increased role. So I think, you know, just to link it to the Trans Mountain, the Kinder Morgan, issue I think the only thing that would really change is um, they've actually increased uh, or, or reversed um, some of the previous government's changes to the Environmental Assessment Act which meant certain people couldn't even participate in the hearings and I know that angered a lot a lot of Canadians um, <laughs> um, just saying your voice doesn't count so I mean perhaps that actually would have resulted in more input into that project and you know, potentially it's it's uh, its rejection. Um, All right. <laughs> just well, to turn some of the arguments um, on um, their head. Yes. On their head there. <laughs> I have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Gretchen Fitzgerald, <laughs> Tim Powers, Grand Chief, Sheila North, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Child marriage in North America is a bigger problem than you may think. In many parts of the continent, the legal age to get married is below 18 with parental consent.